So for the, the most obvious group in an OCHEM that is that can gain or lose a proton is an, and named an acid group for a reason. So acid means that it's something that can easily lose an H plus ion. If we're talking about the, the Bronsted Lowry definition. And so for remember that for a in carboxylic acids, that functional group looked like this. And that's the same thing as the acetate resonance structure we we're going over today. When acetate is protonated, when it has that H attached to it, it's acetic acid. But when it's deprotonated, it can make that resonance structure where it moves a negative charge back and forth. And so it's pretty easy to deprotonate and wind up with the deprotonated form, which is going to have a charge to it. So in the, in the video, this is what he was talking about when he was saying, okay, if you take the acid and you put it in their basic conditions, you can get it to dissolve better in the water. Because if you, if you lose the H plus, which a lot of times we'll just write with as minus H plus. So this is the protonated and deprotonated form. And the pH that that happens is if you think of pH as it, as a like a number line where you could start at zero and move your way up um, to more basic pHs as you go from um, from the acidic pH to the basic pH that's when we're going to see this transition happen and that's what pKa tells you in OCHEM sense pKa is basically telling you the pH where you would go from protonated to deprotonated we're going to think less in terms of buffers for this class and more in terms of which form is more likely to be present. So for the acid, um, I think, was it just, was it uh, chlorobenzoic acid or something for that? In question three, there's salicylic acid. Salicylic acid. So salicylic acid is going to have a, you know, the different R group is going to change whatever it's attached to, but it, what all that really matters is that it's an acid functional group. And then the PKA tells you what pH you need to get to. So if you, as long as you can get the pH, if you get the pH above that 2.79, you're going to have it in this form, which is going to be soluble in water. If you take the salicylic acid and you put it under really acidic conditions, you're going to reprotonate it. You're going to add the H plus back on, and you're going to have this form that won't dissolve in water. And so amines look kind of similar, except that the protonated form is actually the, the form that has the charge because amines are a weak base. So the, the normal uncharged form of an amine just, is just a nitrogen attached to some carbons. And so if we, instead of taking away an H plus amines, you can add an H plus ion and go and turn this into a nitrogen with a positive charge. And I'm actually in the interest of being consistent, I'm gonna rewrite this so that the charge, the protonated form is on the left-hand side, just like above. So in this case, having the extra H plus around in the acidic conditions is what makes the amines more soluble in water. And when you lose an H plus, you're going to go to that neutral form. Right? So, so, go ahead. Sorry. So just like in the video, if we added acid, hydrochloric acid to this mixture, it would make the what is it, P-aminophenol more soluble? Yes, yeah, so amines get more soluble when they're protonated. Acids get less soluble when they're in, in water when they're protonated. Okay. So, and you can kind of think of this, if, you, if we draw out the pH scale like it's a number line, so, zero, 14, seven. So at that, was it 2.79? Mm -hmm. 
everything to the right of this is going to be more acidic for the salicylic acid. So that would be protonated. And everything to the right is going to be deprotonated. And so remember what that form looks like. That's that CO2 with a negative charge for an acid. So if you want an acid to be soluble in a nonpolar solvent, you need it this way. If you want acid soluble in water, you go that way. And then amines are just the exact opposite because they're, what was it, 10.4? If you go more basic, then it's deprotonated and you get that neutral form that this form will dissolve in the nonpolar solvent. And this form, the protonated form, will dissolve in water. So there's, it's one of the reasons why it's tricky to wrap your head around what's going on with this is there's not, you can't just say, okay, add acid to make something more soluble. Adding acid will make amines more soluble in water but it'll make acids less soluble in water. And adding base will make amines less soluble in water, but it'll make carboxylic acids more soluble in water. So really we have to pay attention to, is it, are we making the protonated or the deprotonated form? And then does that have a charge? Which side is charged will tell you which form will dissolve in water. I know that's a long answer for what was a very short question, um, but that's that's the basis behind an acid-base extraction is you manipulate the pH to make what you want soluble in water to be soluble or less. So once it becomes soluble in water, will it, it'll settle out because it's more dense and you pour that off or like the water settles down and you pour that off. Exactly. And I can actually, let me pull up, I'm going to see if I can find a video that actually has what that looks like because it does look kind of interesting. Uh... This is pretty low quality. Let's see if there's a better one. Back of the race stand again. Make sure you don't knock the stock off P1. And then the density of the organic bit. Okay. So let's try this again. Um, so this is going to be one, I believe this is, yeah, they're doing, going to do iodine, which is not very soluble in water. Um, so this isn't going to bring the acid base side into it. This is just going to show you what it looks like when it does settle out. Um, but basically as you add the nonpolar solvent, what will happen is you have, and if you pick the right solvents and you're careful with how you mix them, you get two very, very distinct layers. So that top layer is going to be the nonpolar. Water is more dense than almost all solvents, um, with the exception of dichloromethane. So that bottom layer stays where it was, and it's the same color. Um, turns out when you take iodine and you dissolve it in um, a nonpolar solvent, it's actually bright purple. Um, so that's why you see that color difference between the two layers. And as she mixes it up, it'll settle back out and more and more purple should move into that top, or top layer. Um, so iodine, I, we've actually used iodine for this experiment before just for the reason that you have that cool color change. And that brown color should start to disappear from the bottom layer. Because that iodine, it doesn't happen instantly, but what will happen is eventually is all the iodine will wind up in the nonpolar layer and you'll have a colorless water layer and the and a very dark purple um, 
non-polar layer. So that's, this is what it looks like when it's not so clear. And then it kind of settles out. It'll wind up becoming more clear as you give it time. Um, and that's actually one of the things that you learn in lab is it, it doesn't always separate out cleanly. And sometimes you need to do things um, to fix what's called a, a um, you basically wind up making an emulsion instead of making two distinct layers, um, which is good when it's a solid dressing and bad when, um, when you're trying to do an extraction, when you want it to separate out. So you do things like add salt to it. If you add salt to it, it makes the, the polar layer more polar and it winds up separating out better. Um, and so when you, and so that's what we're going, you would actually wind up seeing. Um, you might not be able to see it visually. You kind of have to just trust that it's happening. Um, if you don't have a colored product, you have to say, okay, I, I can test the pH of my aqueous layer and I know the pH is less than 2.79. And if it's less than 2.79, that means that the acid shouldn't be soluble in it but that the amine will be because the amine will dissolve in the water anything left of 10.4. So if you wanted to actually get both of them soluble in water, what you're really going to want to do is you're going to want to be between these two because you need it to be more basic than 2.79 to make the acid dissolve and less basic or more acidic than 10.4 to get the amine to dissolve. So this region is the region where you could actually get both the salicylic acid and the amine to dissolve in water. You're still looking a little bit lost there. Are you talking about me? Yes. You might okay. just be watching another video already. But. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm totally <laughs> with you. I mean, like, uh, it makes sense. I, it, like, if I tried to walk through it, I'd totally fumble it. But what you're saying makes sense. So, and I know that's one of the things that I liked about Professor Dave is that he goes fast. So it doesn't feel like you're, you're being, you know, talked down to or it's going too slow. But you might need to watch some of the parts a few times or you know, keep asking me questions until it really kind of sinks in. But, and it does take practice. I think, Cody, you took intro to organic, right? Yeah, yeah, so a um, little bit of background. We, we did this, this is one of the big concepts I try to get you guys to understand, but we took like two weeks on it in intro to OCHEM because it was something that you really have to think about and there's those multiple steps, so. So Sean, you know how you said your pH has to be it within that range for both of those to dissolve. Um, is that different from doing it in two steps? So the advantage to doing it in two steps is that you can then keep all of your components separated. Like in the example Professor Dave did where he got all three of his components separated out. If gotcha, but if you're just them, looking for dichlorobenzene, you can do it in one step. Exactly. I see that. Okay. Thanks, John. <laughs> I kind of missed that we were just looking for dichlorobenzene. I totally follow you now. So Sean, just to clarify, if you add hydrochloric acid to a weak base, you are protonating it, you're making it more polar so it can dissolve in water. Yeah, and, and we're, we're a step beyond just making it more polar, we're making it, giving it an actual charge, which is usually enough to take even things that normally be really non, you know, unlikely to dissolve, if they're all the way charged, that's enough to actually get them to be fairly soluble. Um, for these examples, I want to say something like, you know, phenol, I don't know about amino phenol specifically, but phenol, which is just a benzene ring with an OH on it, um, 
it dissolves in water in a really, really low solubility. But if you can protonate it or, or deprotonate it, um, then you can get it to dissolve almost freely, almost as much as like salt, sodium chloride. And benzoic acids the same way. Gotcha. Thank you. Does anybody try and thin layer chromatography yet? So both of the chromatography ones actually go together pretty well. Similar didn't, techniques. Didn't we kind of do a chromatography thing last year in Gen Chem, one of the first labs? It's usually, we usually use it as a good filler lab because you don't need to know that much about chemistry. So before you guys know what you're doing, we use it as a lab to just like, here, let's, let's separate some stuff. Um, yeah, but yeah, that was, if we didn't do thin layer chromatography, then we at least, then we probably did paper chromatography, which is the same concepts just with paper instead of glass. And then, and column chromatography works really the same way. You're just doing it, instead of doing it on a thin layer, you're passing everything through. So at any time you have something called chromatography, what it means is that you're gonna have, have a stationary phase that's not moving and a mobile phase that kind of passes through it or over it. And different, different compounds will bond better to the mobile phase versus the stationary phase. And so you, you basically, they're basically gonna wind up traveling at a different rate through the material or through the, the tested area. Um, and so we use that to separate things out. Yeah, I had to uh, think about six for a while. I kind of answered it hastily and then read it again and thought, uh, hmm. Yeah, uh, and I did not mean to do that, but apparently I split number six up into two different pages. Um, the, the actual question is on the top of page two. Um, but that one do want to, basically it's giving you more information than you need for number six. Right, because all you really need to know to answer the question is solvent Y. Because anytime you have any sort of chromatography, if you get more than one spot, if you get more than one peak, that's basically by definition means that it's more than one compound because all compounds will always come out at the same. They all have, by definition, all a compound has identical properties to every other molecule of that compound. So if you wind up with more than one spot, or more than one peak coming out, that means that you have to have more than one compound. I think I got that wrong. All right, can I resubmit that or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. I always just look at the, the most recent submission unless you're missing something and then I look at older submissions. Thank you. So if you have more than one spot, that's that means that like one of your substances like crawled its way up to one spot and then whatever else was in there made it a little further and however many you have. Yes, exactly. And so it's, it's kind of like, um, I kind of like your analogy crawled out. It's you, it's like taking a, a thin layer chromatography is like taking a snapshot of a race of a foot race or people running where the people that are, that are, um, better at running are going to be closer to the front and the people that are slower are going to be closer to the back. But if you have more than one person, it's going to show up as more than one spot. And same with the, the column is basically who finishes first. You're looking at what comes out the end of the race as opposed to taking a snapshot during the race. Okay. 
Thanks. No problem. Mind if I ask you a question? Please. <clears throat> um, if I'm going to kind of change my perspective on uh, question six there, does it seem logical that maybe a solvent, maybe some of the components in the mixture are not soluble in solvent X, but soluble in solvent Y? Yeah, so that would be one one way or their salt or their solubilities are so close to the same in sol in solvent X that they wind up looking like they're the same, um, like it's the same thing. So for instance, if we use our race analogy, um, maybe solvent X is running on flat ground and there are three runners that are all the same speed on flat ground, and then solvent Y you make them run up a hill and one runner is way better at running uphill than the others. And so they might have all been finished at the same time on flat ground, but once you change the solvent, you're gonna be able to actually get them to separate out a little bit more. Thank you. No problem.
All right, it's been quiet for a while. Everybody watch, watching videos, feeling okay about this? For most of you that are looking to go more the bio region, column chromatography is really important um, because that's the number one way you have of separating proteins out from each other. If you have a big mixture of proteins, column chromatography is the easiest way to get them to separate out. Um, so it winds up seeing a lot of applications in bio, microbial labs, and um, biochem labs. Um, recrystallization, not so much, and TLC, a little bit less so, too. Do you think uh, the methods that they're using for the column chromatography in that medical application are pretty well established, or do you think they're making advancements with their there are some changes that you can do that make things um, that are pretty well understood. Oh, they're still figuring out one, ways to do it. One way you can do it is you can actually use, um, instead of just using like silica beads as your stationary phase, you can actually, it, the technique is called functionalizing them to make it so that they have a greater affinity for certain types of molecules. Um, and so you can actually do things like attach um, attach um, white blood cells or some proteins from white blood cells to the outside of your stationary phase that are going to recognize certain antigens and bind to them. So you can slow down um, certain molecules based on whether or not a organism has, has an immune response to that molecule. So you can get really, really specific um, you can also do things like if you coat the outside of these in um, a specific stereoisomer that's more likely to bond to other stereoisomers that are the same, the same um, chirality, the same you know R versus S. Um, you can actually separate R from S stereoisomers using column chromatography. You just have to use the right beads. Um, in your in your column. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff you can do there. Um, and Elki, the the step by step part of number three, um, that's the one that it really would not have to be very many steps in number three, because if you kept it the right, you might want to add, um, you know, a little bit of strong acid and a little bit of strong base in, in two different steps. Um, but basically, if, if you can get the salicylic acid, um, if you use a aqueous layer that is more basic than 2.79, then the salicylic acid will dissolve in the aqueous layer. And if you use, if you have an aqueous layer that is more acidic or less basic, than 10.4, then you can get the, the periaminophenol um, to dissolve. And so the step-by-step -step process could be, okay, do, you know, add, um, you know, 20, add a portion of 0.1 molar HCl. And what that's going to do is it's going to, that's going to make the uh, aminophenol dissolve. And then you drain off the aqueous layer. And now all that's left in this, in the SEP funnel is going to be the salicylic acid and the dichlorobenzene. And so then you could add point, you know, a portion of, um, of 0.1 molar NaOH, sodium hydroxide, and that's going to make the acid soluble in the aqueous layer. And then when you drain off the aqueous, that aqueous layer, all that's left in the organic layer is going to be the dichlorobenzene. So if you just listed off those steps, you know, add HCl solution, drain off the aqueous layer, add NaOH solution, drain off the aqueous layer, evaporate the solvent for the organic layer that's left, and all that's going to be left after you remove the organic solvent now is going to be the dichlorobenzene. Um, so it doesn't need to be specific in terms of like writing out a lab procedure. You don't need to make up amounts or anything like that. It's not like I gave you very anything very specific to start with. Um, but just real generally speaking, what you would do, and you could even do it as a flow chart um, that 
you know, where you had all three of them together at the beginning and then do one step, you know, add HCL. And now your organic layer has just the acid and the dichlorobenzene. Um, so you could even use a, a flow chart logic to show, okay, this is the step I would do to remove this compound or purify that compound. And I just realized that we're still recording from earlier, which is fine. I will just have to, I'll clip, clip out all that dead time in the middle once we get to that point. Um, but at this point, I think that's the, the main concepts that you guys need to take away from this. I think we've already gone over. Um, has anybody moved on to recrystallization stuff? Okay. Um, so we'll leave that alone. We'll pause the recording for now. All right, so um, remember that the, the main thing we're going to use to, to dictate whether something dissolves in the polar, in the aqueous layer or the organic layer is whether or not it's charged. That's the one that's going to give us a really a slam dunk amount of separation. If you can get something all the way to have a full charge, not just polar, but a full on charge, it'll dissolve in the aqueous layer really, really well. And so the, so you could do this problem if you're just trying to get the, the most nonpolar component, the dichlorobenzene, you could do this with just one step. Um, just use a buffered solution that's buffered at seven, a pH of seven, and that would be enough to get um, the salicylic acid would be deprotonated because if you go, if you have that acid group, when you, when you put it under basic conditions, you go from being neutral to being charged. So basic conditions, you get the depro when deprotonated is always going to mean the same is deprotonated is always going to happen at basic conditions. When you're more basic than the pKa, then most of your molecule is going to be deprotonated. If you're under acidic conditions, you're going to be in the protonated form. Which for acids means that that's going to be less soluble in water. And the deprotonated form is going to be more soluble in water. So if the pKa is 2.8. All you have to do, if you want the acid to dissolve in the aqueous layer, you need to get above that pH of 2.8. And basically, if you're right at a pH of 2.8, what's going to happen is you're going to have 50% of each form. Half of your molecules will be protonated and the other half will be deprotonated. But if you, and if you go to a pH of 3.8, then you actually wind up with a 10 to 1 ratio. 10, you have, for every 10 molecules that are deprotonated, you still have one that's, um, that's protonated. Because remember, that pH is a log scale, and so that's going to apply to that ratio of protonated to deprotonated. So to get all of our salicylic acid to be soluble in the aqueous layer, we want to get pretty basic conditions. Because then we could get, you know, if you get to a pH of, um, 5.8, then for every thousand molecules that are deprotonated, you have one that's left over that's protonated. Right, so, and it can continue on. So if you, if you did an extraction with something that had a pH of, say, 10 or 13, then you're going to have for every billion molecules that are deprotonated, you have one left over that's protonated. So we want to use big drastic differences in pH to kind of make sure that as much as possible of this molecule is in that deprotonated form. Um, on the Sean. flip side, 
if you use like a buffered solution, say at seven, would would it take more rinses to get all the other stuff out? That would be the most effective way to do it is if you if you were going to use a, a buffered solution at seven um, and you and you did the extraction like four times and you gave it lots of time to settle out each time you could probably get just as effective as doing two extractions with really basic followed by two extractions that really acidic so it just it becomes a matter of um, you know what you have and the problem with using a really buffered solution is that that buffer winds up getting involved once you evaporate your, um, if you wanted to keep the contaminants, if you wanted to keep the salicylic acid and the amino phenol, you also are gonna wind up with ever, whatever salt made up that buffer is gonna be mixed in with them once you evaporate the water. So sometimes you, you might not wanna go that route and sometimes it's better to use something that's gonna be really easy to remove later, like ammonium or uh, sodium hydroxide is just really, easy to get rid of because it's super soluble in water as opposed to a buffer where you now you're it's a little bit trickier to get rid of it after the fact um so amines are going to have a very similar approach it's just going to be a backwards because for amines so our amine is going to have a pka of 10.4 and when you are more basic than that, if you're more basic, then you're in the deprotonated form, which was less polar, which doesn't have the charge. So the deprotonated is going to stay, if you use something that's really basic, the amine is going to stay dissolved in the nonpolar layer. So to get rid of the amine, we want to go more acidic because what we do wind up seeing is that we wind up with our functional group looks like nitrogen with four bonds, which makes it, um, which makes it more soluble in the aqueous layer. I'm trying to stand in front of the reflection of my screen, so I'm less try and block that glare a little bit. Doesn't really help. Um, so in this case, we want, we want the amine to be protonated to, if we want it to dissolve in the aqueous layer, which for this problem, that's what we want. I could write a similar problem using the same concepts where I've said something like, we want to make sure that the amine doesn't go into the aqueous layer. And if we want the amine to stay in the, in the non-polar, in the organic layer, we want to make sure we keep it deprotonated. So we, we would want to use a really high pH at that point. Right, so it's all just about sliding back and forth between these two states, protonated versus deprotonated, in order, in the, the PKA tells you where that happens, and the functional group tells you which side is going to be soluble in water. Right, so for each of these, the charged form is soluble in water. So that'd be the deprotonated acid or the protonated amine. Um, do you mind if I ask a question? Not at all. So if you have the protonated amine, let's say that you use something like hydrochloric acid to protonate it, mm -hmm. what prevents the amine from becoming a hydrochloride salt with that acid? That's, that actually is what you're making. You're taking the free base form and, and hydrochloric acid and it turns it into the protonated form and then, but the charge still has to be balanced out. So if you took that, if you took the protonated form, if you protonated the amine with hydrochloric acid and then you removed the water, what you're going to be left with, the crystal that you'll be left with, would be the amine's hydrochloride salt. That's actually would, what you're making when you do that. Would the opposite of that be true as well? So if you took, if you took the hydrochloride salt and deprotonated it, 
what you're left with is an organic material, which would be more oily and, and less likely to make a, a crystal. And that's, that is exactly what happens when you, if you take a hydrochloride salt and put it with a base, that's actually the exact same process that by which that's how you make crack cocaine from cocaine. If you take cocaine, you put it with baking soda and it deprotonates it and you were left with the free base, the deprotonated form, which is then has a much lower vaporization point and can be smoked if one was partial to that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, I'll go ahead and reiterate, especially as this is being recorded, don't do drugs, kids. I'm just explaining that that is something that that is, um, it's a very common practice both in illegal drugs and for pharmaceuticals. Um, generally speaking, if you want something that can be inhaled, you want it in the free base form. You want it in the deprotonated form if it's an amine or the protonated form if it's an acid. So for any sort of an inhaler, you don't want it in the ionic form. You want it in the pro or you want it in the um, non-ionic form. But for anything that you're going to take orally, you want it to be soluble in water, and so you would want it in the ionic form. And so that's why over-the-counter medications are almost always a salt of some form. If you actually look at the active ingredients on most painkillers, it'll actually it's it says acetaminophen, but it's probably acetaminophen hydrochloride or something along those lines because it's gonna got to be um, charged to be soluble in water. And is that, that's true for most, um, oh, I lost my thought. It's, it's going to be true for most medic, me, most medications in general, because taking medications orally is preferable from, in most cases to taking them any other way. It's the most common route of administration. It's the safest. It's the easiest to do over the counter. Um, they can't really just give the average person acetaminophen as a free base and say, okay, what you're going to go is take this home and add hydrochloric acid to it and then drink it. Um, because you're just going to wind up with people killing themselves because they can't do math. Um, so it's, they just do that part for you because they also don't want to take, tell you to take your acetaminophen home and smoke it. Right. That's also, it might be a really effective way to get it into your bloodstream, but it's also not very safe or healthy long term. So that makes most sense. medications are going to go the oral route and are going to either have to be really, really polar molecules are going to have to be in a charged state for the most part. And hopefully that actually puts a little bit of context into why we do this for the, um, for these, these solubilities. It's all about just shifting back and forth on these equilibrium reactions. And again, the uh, one way that I've had a lot of success with people visualizing it is to write it out as a number line. Write your pH scale as a number line and put a mark at your pKa. And then anything that's to the left of that is more acidic and therefore protonated. Anything to the right of that mark is more basic and therefore deprotonated. Thanks for clearing that up, man. No I have uh, questions about the recrystallization too, but I don't want to jump too far ahead. I'm just gonna gonna write out the um, the number line like I was just saying, so that everybody can can see that again. So if we look at the acid that has a pK of 2.8, anything this direction is going to be deprotonated or is going to be protonated. Always, whatever's to the left is going to be the protonated form. And for an acid, that means it's going to be uncharged. I realize they hit that glare. So that would be less soluble in water. And to the right would be deprotonated, which looks like. that with a negative charge, so more soluble in water. And the amine is going to be the exact same concept, except it's 
pKa is all the way up at 10.4. And so above 10.4 is the deprotonated. versus protonated and deprotonated was neutral. And to just finish that thought, that means that for the acid, this would be um, in the organic layer versus the aqueous layer. The charged form is always going to be in the aqueous layer. And for the amine, that means that left of 10.4, more acidic than 10.4 is in the aqueous layer. And more basic would be in the organic layer. All right, so how are we feeling on that, on the solubility? Are we getting there? It's, once you, it's, it's always, it's never going to really be second nature unless you really pursue it and live in this world. Even for me, it's still something that I always have to go, okay, what's the functional group? I need it to be deprotonated. That means I need it to be more basic. That means above the peach. I always still have to go through that, those steps in my head to get all the way down to, I need to use a basic salt um, solution. Um, Seems like you so, did it pretty fast. Yeah. So for the actual steps though, like, do you want us to like write down those actual steps that we're going from? Cause like, I know I'm not thinking of this the right way, but I'm just like, let's just uh, add some acid to it, right? You know, like, I know that's like not, or like, you know, I'm, I'm just like, I'm thinking like too simplistically, like I'm still fairly confused on this. So, so that it doesn't need to be a whole lot more in depth. Um, you know, you can use, think about using the same, the same solutions that are on number two. Like, so just say, those are my solutions I have to choose from. And so, okay, I'm going to use the acidic solution. And then in your, in your answer, you can say, use a portion of the acidic solution. This makes the, um, this will make the, see, I still do have to stop. Um, if it's the acidic solution, it's going to make the amine more soluble because the amine would be protonated and therefore in the aqueous layer. After you drain the aqueous, the acidic aqueous layer off, you could use the basic solution, which is going to deprotonate the acid that's still in there, which makes the acid more soluble in the aqueous layer, and you can drain that aqueous layer off. Right? It can be very qualitative. You don't have to get, you know, put numbers to it or anything. Um, just basically, what did you add? What's going to dissolve in the aqueous layer? And are you keeping that or getting rid of that, basically? OK. And um, for each of the different things, like to make it more soluble, we're just trying to make it more neutral? If or we want it to be more soluble in water, we want it to be less neutral. So we want it to be charged if we want it dissolved in okay. water. All right you'll start getting the hang of that a little bit more because PKAs are going to keep coming back and we're going to keep coming back to that. It's the nice thing about PKA when it comes to OCHEM is we're not going to do any calculations with PKA. We're, all we're going to use PKA for is a way to determine is it charged or is it neutral? Is it protonated or deprotonated? There's no buffer equation involved or anything like that. Um, so it's this same logic is going to happen. It's not always going to have all three things going on at the same time. Um, but that's, it's a, a nice reversible process where we can go back and forth between the states pretty, pretty well. Oh, shoot. Oh, no, it happened again.
got a lot of updates going on or something. Cody, did you, you said you already did this part of the lab, uh, question three at least? Yeah, I went ahead and turned it in, but now I'm learning a couple things are wrong. Uh, so I'm going to go back and fix it. But yeah, I did everything. Was that, I was looking, I was just, um, when he was kind of doing his thing, I was starting to do three. Was that kind of the answer you got to, or was it kind of different from that? Yeah, so it's basically like that first video that we watched where yeah. he goes through like, oh, the, the product is neither acidic nor basic, yeah. so it's not going to be affected. And then you got one thing that's acidic. So you use the base to get rid of that. And then yep. you got something basic. So okay. you use the acid to get rid of that okay. pretty, pretty much. Okay. I just wasn't, cause I was going through the video and I was like, does he want specific? I'm kind of thinking of like gen chem stuff where he was looking for super specific numbers and whatnot. So I was like, is that what he's looking for or not? Yeah. That one took me like an hour to wrap my head around. I kept like jumping around different Google searches and Wikipedia. And like for some reason I couldn't connect the dots for a while, but. Got you. I think he just wants you to understand the basic idea of, of um, you know, the solubility of acids and mm -hmm. bases when you change the pH. I don't think he's asking, because you, you don't have a specific mole value, so I don't think he's asking, you would need that to, to know the how much acid and how much base you yeah. would need to add. So that's why I think he just wants you to get the, the concept. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Which he basically just explained <laughs> to us. Yeah. yeah. Have any of you guys gotten to the last couple of questions about um, recrystallization? Not yet. Not. I don't think I'm that close. <laughs> yeah, that's a no. How about you, Olivia? Um, I'm there. I don't know the answers, but... Uh, I was kind of hoping to go over it with him, but um, I don't know about you guys, but I like live by the tutors. So I'm pretty excited that we have one for this class, but um, I definitely plan on using them for this to finish this lab. But I think um, Cody for the, I think it's the second to last question. Um, and I guess anybody else, uh, do you think it's like a like dissolves like situation? So since, hold on, let me go to it. Uh, so what is it? Naphthalene is nonpolar, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, do you I would say it's nonpolar. Yeah, nonpolar. I would think you'd want to use a polar solvent that way it would crystallize because if, if you used a nonpolar solvent with a nonpolar molecule, it would stay aqueous. Okay, so then maybe water would be the best because that's what I was thinking. I was going to okay. ask him. Um, but yeah, no, no, that's what I was thinking. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can ask him about it. So I figured out what the issue oh, is. Hello. <laughs> At least an issue. Apparently, I put my dog's bed over next to my computer tower, um, and it was my computer was just shutting off and restarting and having immense problems every time she got up and stretched. So I'm thinking that there's a short on my computer case, and she's generating some static electricity that restarts my computer every time she moves. So I moved her. This is the third time that happened today, and it's never happened before. Um, so hopefully, and I'm go switch to my laptop in the meantime to get this going. Um, so Adam, you're on the, the right track with the, we don't want it to be too soluble. The, the thing to remember with the recrystallizations, we're not talking about two layers now. With the recrystallizations, we're talking about, we've got this solid that's a mixture that's mostly product with a little bit of impurity in it. And the best way to get that to get rid of the impurity, we want, to, we want to have a solvent that is, we don't want it to be too soluble because then it'll stay dissolved, which I think is what you said, right, Adam? 
Um, yeah, but I, I wasn't thinking, you know, just less uh, polar or something like that. So, so yeah. with with recrystallizations, we want to actually we want to split it the difference. We want it to be um, soluble, but we don't want it to be too soluble. We want it to be all pretty very soluble at a high temperature and pretty much insoluble at a low temperature. Because if that's that would be like the the ideal recrystallization solvent is if you could have, you know, infinite solubility at, at the boiling point and, and zero solubility at ice temperatures. Because then what will happen is you, it takes very little, you take a little bit of the hot solvent and you add it to your solid and everything will dissolve right away. And then you take it and you put it into an ice bath and, and all of your product crystallizes out when you cool it down. So we need something that's gonna be in between really soluble and a little soluble and insoluble. Which I believe is what um, the options that I gave you guys were, you know, toluene, it's gonna to be really soluble in toluene because they're both nonpolar, they both have, is it, it's naphthalene, right? Yeah, so naphthalene is going to dissolve in toluene really well because they're both completely nonpolar. They're both aromatic and have that, that benzene, those benzene rings. Um, and naphthalene won't dissolve in water at all, even at high temperatures, because water's too polar. So ether is a good mix because it's barely polar. It's a little bit polar because it has that oxygen, but it doesn't have um the benzene ring that's gonna that would make it have a lot of attractive force to stay dissolved i think i totally misunderstood that question i took it as all those structures were the impurities and like what kind of solvent would remove those no so we're trying to pick we don't even know what the impurity is really uh. you know and that's going to be true in in a lot of cases um, where we we have to basically pick something um, that will allow us uh, that will allow us to basically get rid of all of your or dissolve all of your product at a high temperature and then your product will crystallize back out at the low temperature. Um, so let me make sure I did write that in a reasonable way and that um, and I can clarify some of the language then too. Yeah, Maybe I had a hard little... time understanding the uh, what A, B and C was as well. I thought I wasn't sure if you were because it says the reaction listed below. So that's why I, I looked below for oh, those yeah. uh, um, reactants. So can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. So ether is the best option because it's slightly polar. So it's not like too polar that it won't dissolve the naphthalene, right? Correct. But it's a, why do you want it like a touch polar? So um, you can actually see it a, um, a little bit. If you look at number nine, if you look at that solubility graph. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so this is for a different compound. This is the solubility of, of um, sulfanilamide, um, which doesn't matter what the structure is. You're given this, this um, solubility. Um, and you can see that that, but it's got kind of that exponential shape to it. And what that's going to show you is basically that if you get up to the boiling point, which is around 80 Celsius, it's got a lot of solubility, you can dissolve 200 milligrams per milliliter of the solvent. So it dissolves really well at the high temperature. And then it, when you, if you took that, if you said, okay, I've got a saturated solution at 80 Celsius, that means that I've got 200 milligrams for every one milliliter of my solution. If you then took that and you dropped the temperature to zero, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm then your sol solubility goes from 200 milligrams per milliliter all the way down to something like 10 milligrams per milliliter. And so you want it to dissolve at the high temperature and then you want it to not dissolve at a low temperature. The whole idea is we, we get it dissolved 
right, then we right. make it precipitate back out by right. dropping the temperature. Um, if you had something where it was really soluble, then this, this graph would look more like a straight line at all the temperatures, or it might look, have the same shape, but even at zero, it still might have a solubility that was really high. Um, if you have something where it's really insoluble, then this might look like a flat line down at the bottom where it doesn't matter what the temperature is, you can't get any of it to dissolve anyway. So because we both want it to dissolve and then undissolve, we need some something that has high solubility and then low solubility. Does that okay, make okay. sense a little bit? It seems totally. counterintuitive. Um, but that's that's one of the trickiest thing about recrystallization is picking the solvent. Because if you don't have this graph in front of you, or just you're just trying to guess, you kind of are looking for the Goldilocks zone, where you want it to be soluble but not too soluble. Sean, that kind of brings up my next question for number nine. Um, doesn't really say what temperature we're really dealing with here. If we're trying to get 155 milligrams, am I missing the point here or something? Because we could, you know, we could bring it up to 80 degrees, and then that's going to be different than what it is at 40 or 60. You know. So that's that's always going to be what we're going to do with recrystallizations. And I did not specify this. Um, I should be estimate the amount of of hot 95 percent mm -hmm. ethanol. And hot almost always means at the boiling point. Or close to the boiling point, so up around 80 Celsius. Gotcha. Um, so, but and that's that's the whole point. Then, if is you you want to add just enough to totally dissolve it when it's hot, and then that way when you cool it down, almost all of your product comes back out as a solid. And Cody, that kind of goes to what we were saying when I was saying earlier. If you wanted, if you had a something where you knew that most of what you had was a certain compound and you had a little bit of impurity, then recrystallization is a great way to do this because your, your impurity, you might only have 10 milligrams of your impurity total. So your impurity, when you recrystallize out, will probably stay dissolved when you bring the temperature down because you have so much less of it. At, at the very least, a lot less of it will crystallize out than your, than your major product, what you have the most of. That makes um, sense. But if you have something that's closer to 50-50, then recrystallizations aren't gonna work nearly as well, um, unless there's a big difference in solubility. Yeah, for some reason I overcomplicated that problem, but um, if you don't mind, I'd just check and see if some of that logic was right. Um, you go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And then Olivia, did you have a question too? Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm looking at a really small screen. It looked like you raised your hand. <laughs> so I was thinking that um, toluene was one of the impurities in our mix of naphthalene. Mm -hmm. So in picking out the, uh, the right solvent to use, I was trying to take into account what, what type of solvent could I use where toluene would stay dissolved at the lower temperatures, whereas naphthalene would want to recrystallize at the lower temperatures. And I was kind of looking at the melting point. Um, so I thought if I used methanol, um, the melting point of toluene is like negative 95 degrees Celsius. So that seemed to me that at room temperature or close to, you know, the temperature of ice or whatever, the toluene would probably stay in the form of a liquid, whereas the naphthalene would start to precipitate out. Yeah, and, and so that is another way to do separations is to, to use the melting points to do things differently. If you can keep it at a certain temperature, that's absolutely a good thing you, you could do. And that, that's sort of the inverse of distillation, right? Distillation, we boil things and whatever has got the lower boiling point boils off first and we could then condense it and keep it or get rid of it. Um, or what, what you're describing if in... Um, in bootlegging terms is called a freeze distillation, um, which is actually what they used to do in New England in the winters um, in the colonial times, is they would have a big, a big barrel of um, hard apple cider that was, you know, eight, nine percent alcohol. And then they would leave it outside. And then in the morning, when it was super cold out, they would take the ice off the top because the ethanol didn't crystallize out, but water did. 
So they were basically doing exactly what you're describing, dropping the temperature. They didn't have control over it. They were dropping the temperature naturally and then removing the water that crystallized out as ice. And what was left, they called Applejack. Um, and Applejack, a, sorry, it's, a, it's a recipe for a hangover because you're concentrating the ethanol, but you're also concentrating all the methanol and all the other impurities as well. That if you distill it based on temperature, based on heat, you're going to get rid of all that nasty stuff. Um, so it's really, really bad for you. But that's actually the easiest way to distill liquor from something like wine or apple cider is to just freeze it and take off the ice. Um, and, and if that, you started with like a good quality type of alcohol, you wouldn't have to worry about the imp impurities. You could concentrate the ethanol if you started with a clean product. Yeah, the problem is, is once you reach a certain point, it doesn't work anymore um, because when you freeze it, it all freezes at the same temperature. And so, and that happens to be around 40% alcohol or 80 proof, which is also what you get after one, one time distilling something really carefully with heat. You also wind up with water and alcohol in that same 60-40 same ratio. Um, so it does have its, if you started with vodka, you couldn't make the vodka stronger, at least not noticeably, maybe a couple percent um, before you would just wind up with all of it freezing at the same time. I feel like even with something like beer, all of it would freeze at the same time too though, right? If you do it carefully, um, and if you, if you drop the temperature slowly. Probably has to do with the surface area too, right? Exactly. And so if, if with a big barrel of it, you could, you know, the surface is going to get cold faster. And so you wind up with an ice layer building, which then you could do it. If you did it with, you know, in a cup in your freezer, it's going to be a lot harder to do that to basically to stop it halfway. Um, it would still be possible, but um, if anybody's, if you've ever seen the, um, the Corona, put a Corona, Corona in the freezer party trick. Um, it, a Corona, unless your freezer is really cold, a Corona won't freeze in the freezer. Um, but as soon as you take the lid, take it out of the freezer, take the lid off and then knock loose a little bit of the carbonation, it'll all freeze at once. But what little bit isn't frozen is going to be a lot more alcohol than water. So if you had a way to remove all of that slush, what's left is going to be mostly, is going to be a lot more alcohol anyway. Um, yeah, I'm glad. Sorry, just going to say I'm glad that wasn't terrible logic. Go ahead, RJ. Sorry, this was kind of going off what you guys were talking about. So then if you, if we were to stick a, a beer in the freezer and it freezes and you were to pull it out and wait, you know, 10, 20 minutes, there is some that have, that has melted. That would be the higher alcohol content than the rest of the ice chunk that's in there. Yeah. Um, most of most of the the water that will stay frozen the longest is going to have is going to be the least concentrated solution. Um, and they actually, I used to do this in Germany too before, in probably pre-colonial or similar to the same time period. Um, they would make they call it a um, ice beer. Um, is you freeze freeze your beer and then remove the ice, and what's left is going to be a lot stronger than what you started with. So that's how you would get things like. Um, that was basically their equivalent of malt liquor. Which is also, actually I just made this connection, why the stronger, really cheap um, beer, it, like Natty Ice is higher alcohol percentage than Natty Light. It's because they're basically, they're, they're making it similar to an ice beer technique. Um, so that Do you mind going it. over question seven, Sean? Not at all. I'm just I'm just talking about random stuff at this point. So <laughs> Okay. I'm 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 kind of I'm lost. I, I'm sure you already talked about it because I, I heard with you know the um ether and A, B, and C. Um I was just I'm pretty confused on what A, B, and C is um referring to. And, so yeah, I'm still a little lost too, so um, no, I mean, you can, if you want to answer that, you can, maybe that'll give me a head start. So, and I may have, I may have made things worse because I jumped in in the middle of the conversation. I was assuming you were talking about eight when you were talking about this, but because I heard you talking about ether, picking the ether and versus toluene. 
for seven, it's, it's a chromatography question. So we're talking more about how quickly something goes through, um, through a certain reaction, which I forgot to copy and paste for you, but it doesn't really, no, you do need to know what A, B, and C are in order for this to make sense. Um, so no wonder you guys were confused. Let me pull, pull up that uh, problem in he, um, from the textbook that I pulled it out of. Um, now basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to rank them by how well they're going to interact with the solvent versus the, the stationary phase, which is going to be that silica that has, so polar molecules are going to be more likely, or they're going to move slower because they're not going to interact as strongly with the solvent because that solvent is pretty, is um, non-polar. That's the one I want. Um, and in order to share my screen, I'm going to try going back to my desktop real quick. So we'll see if it lets me, if Zoom lets me do this or what's going to happen here. Ah. This meeting is being recorded. I think you're muted. Oh. Um, I, I was getting my him. other account oh, nope. out of the room um, before I unmuted to limit the feedback so that I could go back to my desktop that hopefully will not reboot on me one more time now that the dog's not in here. Um, that is a statement that never would have made sense a week ago. Um, pull up that screen share. Melting points, recrystallization, and we wanted all right. Um, let me for, for number seven, let's just hold off on number seven and we'll talk about that once I've tracked down that figure. Um, I will attach it all as a, a separate file to that assignment right after this PDF um, in the in this canvas link um, and we can go over that at the beginning of class on um, on Thursday just because I don't I thought I remembered where it was but now I'm now I'm having second thoughts about that um, so I need to make sure I can track down the right figure there um, yeah, give me give me time on that and I'll I'll figure something out. Give you some give you some compounds for that. So skip number seven for now. Um, but I can explain the logic behind it, which is just that if we have if we have three possible compounds that are all mixed together and we want to separate them based on chromatography. We're going to be looking at which ones, whatever is going to be more soluble in the mobile phase, which is going to be the, the liquid that's moving through this, um, is going to go through the fastest. And whatever is least soluble in the, in, the sol in the solvent is going to move the slowest. So if you have A, B, and C, you're basically going to rank them by solubility, and whichever one is the most soluble in a non-polar solvent like hexane and ether. All that hexanes and ether are, are needed for for this one is you just need to know that that's a non-polar solvent. And then whatever's most soluble, so then the least polar compound will move the fastest. So it would elute off the first. Um, and the most polar would be the last one to come off the column because it's going to stick better to the beads and to the, um, the silica compared to the solvent. I remember where I got this one now. This is what happens when I write labs at 10 o'clock at night. As I, 
forget to include certain details that are necessary and relevant. Can we watch why cats need, according to science? That looks pretty interesting. You get some interesting uh, recommendations from Firefox when you just get through the, uh, the new tab button. This one. There's A, B, and C. Um, so we have a ketone, which has a polar bond, but doesn't have an oxygen hydrogen polar bond. A, an alcohol, which is going to be a more polar group than a ketone, because you have two polar bonds attached to the oxygen as opposed to just one. And one of those polar bonds is between oxygen and hydrogen, which is a really polar bond. And then the last one, your product C, is going to be almost entirely nonpolar, pretty much entirely nonpolar. There's no oxygen left, no polar bonds left. So C, for this, for this question where it says what's gonna come off first, C is gonna be the least polar, which means most soluble in the solution, which means it's gonna move through the column fastest. And it will elute off first. Eluting just mean it means comes out the bottom of the column. Um, I don't know why we need a, a new word for that. Um, makes it through the column first, finishes the race first, whatever analogy you, you choose to use. So then, so C will come off first, and then you have A and B. A and B are both going to be polar, but A is a lot less polar than B is. So A is going to come out next. So C, then A, then B in that order. And no, you unless if you if you ranked the the molecules in that table for number eight, um, you could have, have come up with an answer based on those molecules um, using the same logic. And if you're so if your logic was right for these four molecules, Water is the most polar out of these, so it should come through the slowest and be the last thing through out of the column. Naphthalene and toluene are both gonna be really close to the same polarity, so they're gonna come out close together. I don't even know if you could really pick which one would be most likely to come out um, first. And then the diethyl ether is barely polar, so it'll come out after the naphthalene and the toluene, but way before the water. And so always with the column, with any of the chromatography things, you're looking for what's going to have the strongest bonds to the stationary phase is going to go the slowest. And what's got the strongest bonds or most attractive force or highest solubility with the mobile phase is what's going to go the fastest. Sean, I'm trying to remember, why would the silica react with the polar? Um, reactants the most why would it slow it down i'm kind of forgetting let me go to um i think it was in the the thin layer chromatography um with professor dave oh yeah i haven't finished all the videos yet sorry so no it's it's totally okay um so anytime you've got a a and this is something we don't talk about when you talk about crystal structures in gen chem is that crystal structures have a surface where the crystal structure ends usually when we talk about crystal structures we're talking about what they call the bulk material meaning the part that's not on a surface but anytime you have a surface that crystal structure is going to be interrupted by something and the most common way that happens is you wind up with a bunch of ohs at the edge of that crystal structure, at the edge of that surface. Um, and those, so those OHs are all really polar. So anything that's gonna be, um, any polar molecules are going to bond to the surface really well, especially if you've got a nonpolar liquid moving across the surface, they're more likely to stick to the surface than they are to let go of the surface and move into that um, liquid phase. Um, it'll happen, but it's going to be based on, on probability and, you know, what the, um, you know, 
on the statistics of it, you know, one time out of every one molecule out of every thousand will dissolve and move down to the next bead. Versus if something's really soluble, it's almost all of it's going to be in the move moving phase and very little of it will be sitting stuck to the surface because there's not as much in the way of attractive forces between a nonpolar molecule and these OHs, these hydroxyls. That answer what you were thinking? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it does. And I, I forgot that when uh, I was just thinking about like how like silicon dioxide, it really is all, it has to have that surface layer. It's crazy. Sur surfaces are weird. Um, and there's a, that's actually one of the most interesting things about material science is that you have to be able to model the surfaces to be able to accurately predict things like, oh, this material is going to break down when it's exposed to water. Um, you know, that's, that's why your lithium ion batteries that in your cell phone lose capacity over time. They'll lose capacity faster if you crack them open on accident because a little bit of moisture that gets in there will basically break down the surface of the cathode um, and all of a sudden it, it can't hold a charge as well. Um, so those, those surfaces are actually, I took an entire grad level course called surface chemistry. It was just about how do you do things? How do you calculate things at a surface? Because it's weird. Wow. That's a lot of surfaces. <laughs> it was a long course. It was a little bit more in depth than I thought it was going to be, but it, uh, it did really make the point. All right. Any other questions? How are we doing on this? We've reached, we reached a point where everybody needs to take a break and go do something else for a little bit and then ask questions on Thursday, maybe. Okay. Yeah, that's let's me. Do, let's do that. Um, do be sure if you have lingering questions, be sure to watch the videos and then bring those questions to class on Thursday, either email me or just ask me at the beginning of class. All right. All right, I will see you guys then. Thanks, Sean. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Bye, guys. Mind if I chew on your ear for another minute? Not a problem. What's up? I was just trying to conceptualize a good way to go about picking out a solvent for that recrystallization based off of the type of uh, product you're trying to recrystallize. So it's without having that uh, you know a solubility figure you know that the the perfect way to do it if you if everything was um ideal was you would grab one of these one of these charts for your compound in several different solvents um the the information is out there it might not be easy to find sometimes um you might just be able to get it as a as an Excel spreadsheet and actually have to plot this yourself if you really wanted to do it. Um, but you could you could conceivably have okay these are my five possible solvents. Make a chart that has their solubility versus temperature for your specific product that you're trying to recrystallize. Um, if I was if we were doing this and we were chemical engineers trying to perfect a process and you know needed as much efficiency as possible but we also had you know really high purity demands um, which would be the case for anybody working in the pharmaceutical industry right you need to get good efficiency but you also need to make sure you don't poison your customers um then you would you know we would go through and we would find a bunch of different solubility data for all possible solvents that we could use plot them all find the one that probably find the one that has the biggest difference in solubility from the between the boiling point and zero Celsius. Because so it's more research based than it is like conceptual thinking about it. We can take a stab at it by just saying, okay, well, I know I don't want to use toluene to recrystallize naphthalene because they're too close to the same. Um, the good news, the good thing about it is you do have that uh, that melting point difference as well so if you did drop the temperature you could rely on the naphthalene to be to freeze basically um yeah because the toluene would, would have a much lower this, right it wouldn't be quite the same as doing a a recrystallization because your impurities might do the same thing 
Um, so really what we're looking for is the biggest, is something that's going to be able to dissolve our product, but not dissolve it really well, is, is the conceptual way to it, is in the, you know, you're looking for the Goldilocks zone. Not too soluble, not too insoluble, somewhere in between. And not a whole lot of consideration goes into what the contaminants are? I mean, sometimes it will, but the, you know, it, the thing is, that even if it, uh, the contaminant, let's say we're looking at this, this graph here, even if the contaminant has the exact same solubility, if you've got less of it than what you have of your product, um, then let's say that out of every 100 milligrams, well, let's say 200 since our solubility is 200, let's say we have 200 milligrams of product, and of that 200 milligrams, maybe 20 milligrams of it was the impurity. So when we dissolve all 200, we dissolve the impurity and we dissolved our product. When we cool it back down, we still have down here, let's call that 10 milligrams of sol per milliliter of solubility down here. So out of our 180 milligrams of product that we had, 170 of it is going to crystallize back out. But out of our 20 grams of impurity that dissolved, 10, 10 milligrams crystallized back out, and 10 stay dissolved. So we just and you could repeat that process exactly. So we just cut the amount of impurity in half if we do that. And if we do that again, it's not just going to cut it in half again because now maybe all of the impurity stays dissolved, or almost all of it. Um, and so we might. So if we do, especially if you do multiple recrystallizations in a row, whatever you have the most of, even if their solubilities are the same, whatever you have the most of is going to wind up getting perpetually purified. But every and time you do that, you lose a little bit of your product. You lose 10 milligrams of your product. So because the idea is to use the smallest amount of solvent possible, is it fair to say that we're getting very close to our point of saturation or that's the whole idea is that we we're we're trying to keep it saturated you had just enough of your solvent so that you reach you're still saturated but just barely so all of your solid is dissolved but it's still saturated and then when you cool it back down because if you add a whole bunch more solvent then you're gonna wind up with a bunch of it staying dissolved when you cool it down, right? Because you're you're not starting at the saturation point. So as long as you're at the saturation point, the total volume doesn't really matter? Exactly. Okay. And it, the total volume is just, at that point, it's just gonna depend on how much product you had, right? If yeah, because I'm, five. I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off, man. No, it's okay. It's just going to say if you have five grams of product, you're going to need more solvent to get all five grams dissolved. But you're still going to lose the same percentage every time you do that because you're, you're, it's going to be based on what's the solubility at the saturation point at high temperature and the saturation point at low temperature. Or do you know if we're going to touch on like the, uh, the, physical shape of the crystal structure at all, or we're just going to say it's a solid? Um, maybe very briefly. Um, organic molecules, their crystal structure looks, is much more complicated than simple ions. Ions, we just treat them like they're all spheres. And they, you know, you remember doing that, those crystal structures where everything's sort of packed in together. Um, when you have more complicated shapes of the molecules, the way they pack together changes too. Um, they do things like they, they call it pi stacking where all of the, um, where all of the aromatic rings will stack on top of each other. Um, and you wind up making, you know, with your crystal growing preferentially in one direction versus the others. And so that's why you wind up when you do organic crystals, you wind up with these needle like crystals sometimes. Um, versus ionic compounds tend to grow equally in all three dimensions, and so that you get a lot more hexagonal or or just cubic crystals. 
Yeah, I ran into a lot of different uh, crystal shapes with ionic compounds when I was messing around doing like recrystallization with like ice cream salts and Epsom salts and kosher salts and stuff like that. And it, it was widely varied, especially with the Epsom salts. It was, you could obtain like a way more needle like crystal structure with a higher temperature. But if you didn't let it get that close to the boiling point, but still got it saturated, you would get much, much larger like rock candy looking crystal structures. And part of that's going to be dependent on which you're probably making different hydrates because um, magne Epsom salts in particular have a bunch of different forms of, of hydrates. The form that you buy it in is the heptahydrate, but you could change which hydrate it favors by changing what the temperature of crystallization is. Um, so you might have been making the pentahydrate might have been the one that you are forming at the really high temperatures. Um, but the heptahydrate, like the ones that you get when it's up, coming out of the box, might have been what you were forming at the low temperatures. Um, but yeah, crystal, crystal structures are really cool and interesting, but they're also incredibly tricky to generalize um, because there are so many different variables and different shapes of molecules, especially when you get into organic stuff. I really like to think about and conceptualize this kind of stuff because you get you can like observe it in real life. You know, you can watch a precipitate or recrystallization or whatever happen. It kind of you're like, okay, I can actually see this. Yeah, um, and you might try. You might look at you know YouTube videos of um, you know look at organic um, crystallization it might give you some really interesting. Um, videos on that that'll form different shapes but yeah you tend especially with aromatic compounds you get a lot of the long needle-like crystallization so there's benzoic acid see if I can find good like that. oh yeah we did our uh, experiment with melting point and freezing point with that in lab yeah yeah, and so it does that too. Naphthalene does the same thing. It makes these long needle-like crystals if you do a sublimation of naphthalene. Um, it's a sublimation. So, so like, remember there's that phase change but where you go straight from gas, from a solid to a gas without oh, liquid? Right, right. If you, if you sublime, naphthalene goes through a sublimation at atmospheric pressure. If you heat it and then cool it down, it'll... It'll go straight from a solid to a gas, and then when it reforms, if you have like a, a watch glass full of ice on top, um, you, it'll reform into these long crystals, crystal-like structures. And that's actually when you could do at home, um, just with uh, uh, mothballs. Mothballs are mostly naph naphthalene is the um, active ingredient in most mothballs. Um, yeah, I saw that on Wikipedia earlier. Yeah. So you could you could even try doing that, you know, just be careful not to inhale too much if it's not great for you. It's not gonna kill you, but not a great idea. Um, and if you just did something like put um, just like a, a piece of glass or um, something, even um, an upside down pot lid um, that you could put ice in the top of it. If you heated the naphthalene below and then had ice on the, in the inside of the pot lid, it'll make these really long crystal structures hanging off of it. Oh, it'll form on the bottom of the glass. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so if you're heating it from below, you know, like if you just took a pot and just put some, some mothballs in the bottom and then put the pot lid on top except upside down so it was pointed downward, then you could yeah. pop some ice in the top and cool down the bot the inside of the, of the um, lid. So little miniature stalactites go in there? Exactly, yeah. That's cool. But I am going to have to sign off here um, just to uh, start getting ready for dinner here. Yeah, man, um, you're Elke, good. Elke, are you still there? Do you have any questions? I am still here. I'm starting number nine. Um, I know that um, I think Emily, Emily mentioned maybe talking to you one-on-one -on -one at some point or going yeah. to your your um what is it your uh open your office hours so maybe i'll pop in there then unless you want to go over it really quickly with me 
Um, I can, we can definitely do this. This is, this is similar to what I was, I was talking to Cody about. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, so if we're trying to estimate how much ethanol we're going to need, we're trying to estimate at the highest temperature, which is the, the, the top end of this um, graph here is right around, I think it's 78 Celsius is the boiling point of ethanol at sea level. Um, so basically what that tells us is, okay, if I have hot ethanol for every 210, you know, pick some point, you can all even just say 200 milligrams. For every 200 milligrams uh -huh. of ethanol, I'm going to need one milliliter of solvent. Sorry, for every 200 milligrams of the, of the product, of the sulfonilamide, I need one milliliter of ethanol. Um, because all this is, is, remember, solubility is just how much can you have dissolved per unit volume. Mm -hmm. So this is actually, you can actually just write it as a straightforward conversion. Um, if, you, if you say, okay, I'm looking at this graph, and I can say that at, at 78 Celsius, I can dissolve one milliliter of ethanol equals 210 milligrams dissolved. Mm -hmm. If you can treat that like it's a conversion, you can just say, okay, I've got 155 milligrams. So we say 210 milligrams um, of sulfonilamide equals one milliliter of hot ethanol. Mm -hmm. Do you mind, um, do you mind clicking, pinning Sorry. more screen? Thank you. So if we have that, if we have this equality, we can use that as a conversion. We can just say, okay, well, however much I have, whatever it is, 155 milligrams of the sulfa, sulfa milamide, and just call it sulfa. Mm -hmm. And for every 210 milligrams, I need one milliliter of ethanol. You get your milligrams of sulfa canceling out, and that just that'll tell you right there. Okay, I'm going to need something less than a milliliter. Okay. Um, and that's it. Seems like a really small amount, but that's we're dealing with a pretty small amount of product, 155 milligrams isn't very much. And so it won't take very much ethanol when it's mm -hmm. hot to, to get it to fully dissolve. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. No problem, so you're all good then? Yeah, I'm all good. All right, cool, I'll see you on Thursday. All right, see you then, bye.